Welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show, hosted by Mason Kern. He keeps his nose to the ground to report on what's trending in professional and college sports, to inform, enlighten, and entertain. And now it's... The Sports Watchdog! The Sports Watchdog, Mason Kern. Hey everyone, welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix. I'm Mason Kern here with you every Sunday from 7.30 to 8 a.m. Obviously, I'm certainly glad you decided to join me this morning. And as always, I do have some great stuff in my kennel. Today we're going to be talking to former Super Bowl champion and Pro Bowl NFL offensive tackle Bryant McKinney, as well as the assembly member for the 41st Assembly District in California, Chris Holden. I'll also be covering some sports hot topics and a few basketball-specific fans, interesting happenings on the hardwood. So I'll first pitch it on over to the NFL as the draft is on the rise, and I kind of just want to take a minute and give you guys my, uh, my predictions, my hot takes, really, for what I think is going to happen throughout the first round of this NFL draft. I mean, don't get me wrong, the quarterback class is pretty stacked, but... There's also some other positions that I think teams really need to take a a heavy look at. So, number one overall, obviously, Cleveland Browns do have it. And, God, we've known for so long after they went winless last year, they had an undefeated season in which they didn't win a game. So, it's actually the opposite of an undefeated season. It's the reverse undefeated season. And they've had some horrible luck with quarterbacks in their time, but they had a very productive offseason. I mean, they got Tyrod Taylor. They've gotten some nice receiving help um, at wide receiver. But I think the Browns still do go with the quarterback if they don't take Saquon Barkley. I do think Saquon Barkley is probably the most talented player possibly in the draft as a whole. Definitely the most talented running back. I think he has very high upside. So if the Browns decide not to take Barkley at running back, which I I would be kind of surprised about. I I think they go with Sam Darnold from USC. I mean, he's very clean. I think he would fit into their system very well. Obviously, I mean, Tyrod Taylor as well. You'd be fighting for minutes there. And it wouldn't make a lot of sense, I guess, because they just got Taylor. But, I mean, I think Sam Darnold is probably the best quarterback in this class, Um, at least the most polished, in my opinion. And I think he has a better track record uh, in conference than Josh Allen does. Um just based on their tough conference schedule, USC I'm talking about. So I do think Browns either go with Darnold or Barkley. And then Josh Allen, who I mentioned before, I don't see him making it past the New York, the New York Jets because I just think his upside is too high that I don't see him slipping below them, if he even makes it to them, if the Giants, uh, the New York Giants don't select Josh Allen with that pick. But in terms of non-quarterback options, I think Bradley Chubb, is probably going to go bottom, probably six overall. I think the Indianapolis Colts really, really need him in terms of uh, positions outside of quarterback. Uh, I think he is kind of the the perfect fit for the Colts because they need a player of his caliber in that position. Um, pass rushing is a big problem for them right now. So I could see him going fourth through sixth. I don't think he makes it in the top three, though. I would I would be pretty surprised. And then back on quarterbacks, I mean, Baker Mayfield, obviously a lot of drama with this kid. I mean, I, I, I do think teams want him. He's impressed in his, uh, in his combine work. And I could see Denver maybe taking him, possibly the Patriots, Bills, or Cardinals possibly trading up. I mean, Arizona Cardinals did just trade up, or, or Arizona Cardinals did just sign Sam Bradford to that one-year $20 million contract, but maybe have Baker Mayfield kind of either back him up or be the quarterback of the future. But at the end of the day, I think this is a very quarterback-heavy draft class. I think that Lamar Jackson is someone who you're going to see. Mason Rudolph is someone you're going to see. I think probably Carolina Panthers are going to most likely take a defensive back. I know they're struggling as well with wide receiver help, but I think they need a defensive back more. And, I mean, Odell Beckham... A lot of drama with this guy right now. I mean, are they going to trade him? Are they going to keep him? Talking about the New York Giants. Who knows? I mean, there's already been some big moves this season. Richard Sherman no longer with the Seahawks. He's a 49er. Could see another high-profile player in Odell Beckham Jr. Find a new team at the end. But those are my hot takes for this 
upcoming NFL draft. Hopefully tune in. Hopefully I'm right. We'll uh, just have to wait and see. As always, hit me up on social media and let me know what you think about these and other trending sports topics at A Sports Watchdog on Twitter and at The Sports Watchdog on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as well. Now, speaking of social media, the social world was kind of set on fire this week after who? Oh, yeah. Connor McGregor. I'm sure you know the name. They've been in a lot of news recently. I mean, dating back to the Floyd Mayweather versus Connor McGregor boxing super fight. But now he's in it for a, a different reason, a not so good reason this time. He um he's been charged with three misdemeanor assault charges and one felony because apparently he went to UFC 223 Media Day and he thought it would be a good idea to take a dolly and throw it through a bus. Y you heard that correctly, throw it through a bus. And and that bus had UFC fighters in it, three of which are now injured and had to pull out of the fight card, UFC 223, and Conor McGregor kind of went haywire. I mean, this guy has a kid at home, he's got a wife, I mean, it, it was very sad to see, it kind of goes back to him being a hoodlum in Ireland, I mean, that's what he looked like, he almost like threw a temper tantrum, and people are all over social media talking about it, should... Is this a publicity stunt? Is Dana White actually on his side? What's going on right now? Nobody really knows. But it's kind of sad to see McGregor do this. I mean, he, he turned himself into the 78th precinct in New York, so he is in police custody now. But like I said, I mean, kind of sad to see him revert back to that after having such a successful career. This could kind of be the downfall of it, so we'll have to wait and see what happens, what fallouts occur due to his actions. All right, everyone, the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. We'll be right back after this. Be prepared for those rainy days with Weatherman, the only umbrella blending unmatched quality with smart technology and ingenious design, led by meteorologist Rick Reckmuth. The Weatherman app pairs with the Pebblebee Bluetooth tracker to detect the forecast, then provides alerts when you need to take your umbrella along. A tracker also ensures you will always know where to find your umbrella when needed. Visit weathermanumbrella.com to learn more. Welcome back to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. I'm Mason Kern, and joining us now is Bryant McKinney, former Super Bowl champion NFL offensive tackle and the creator and founder of the B Major Foundation. Bryant played college football at the University of Miami for two seasons, where he earned consensus two-time All-American honors, the Outland Trophy, the 2001 National Football Championship, Sports Illustrated Player of the Year, and was inducted into UM's Sports Hall of Fame as part of the class of 2012. His impressive collegiate career led him to being drafted 7th overall in the first round of the 2002 NFL Draft by the Minnesota Vikings, where he would spend nearly 8 years of his professional career. Bryant was selected as a first alternate in the 2007 Pro Bowl, and made his first Pro Bowl appearance in the 2009 season. He incredibly didn't miss a single game due to injury in his whole NFL career, which consisted in playing 132 consecutive contests. Bryant's NFL career also saw appearances for the Baltimore Ravens, whom he won a Super Bowl with in the 2012 and 13 season, as well as the Miami Dolphins before he retired in 2013. These days, he's on the show Love and Hip Hop Miami, the latest installment of the hit VH1 franchise that's going to explore Miami's hip hop, Latin, and reggaeton music scene and rich Latinx culture. He's also part owner of Repent, which is a clinical grade hangover super shot. So, Brian is here to share some insight about his NFL career and talk about his transition from the league to a successful businessman and entertainer, as well as give us some more info on the B Major Foundation. Hey, Brian, welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show. Thanks for having me. I got to match your energy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. Thank you so much again for coming on today. So first off, let's just start by you telling us a little more about the B Major Foundation. What is it really and, and how did it come to be? Um, the B Major Foundation was just my way of putting together a foundation and giving back to the community, um, the different communities that I lived in. So I live in Miami, Florida, and then I'm from New Jersey. So those are the two major communities I like to give back. And B Major basically goes towards uh, single, single parent homes and uh, healthy kids and healthy living. So I do things to keep kids active. And then I try to also donate money to the single parent homes because I came from a single parent home. 
Uh, it's definitely really incredible. I mean, that you're you're kind of doing this that initiative. But but how hard was it really kind of transitioning from a career in the NFL to to the business world? And then how was it difficult to adjust to life after football? You know, what's funny is I just had this conversation yesterday because I had to do a brain and body um, assessment with uh, for the NFLPA, and the psychologist she asked me the same question. And the thing, the difference between me and some of the other guys who are trying to make this transition is. I didn't identify myself as a football player my entire career. Um, I was always social, and I didn't start playing football until I was 14, so basically not until high school. Mm -hmm. However, I played other sports. Um, My mom put me in wrestling first, and then after that I was doing basketball, and I did that all the way up until high school. So my identity wasn't always the athlete, and a lot of things I did I was doing because they were fun for a sport. But at the same time, it taught me discipline, and it taught me how to work together with other people. But it was never my identity. My identity was my personality, and that was something I was able to always have shine brighter than me being just an athlete. So by the time it was time for me to retire, I, in my mind, I already built like a big catalog of just different people I was friends with who, when I wanted to start doing events, I could call on in to do, you know, little hosting tapes for me because I've done so much for them over the years. Uh, it's definitely a great mindset, I think, to have, especially as a professional athlete, because you got to kind of think about life after football, and you seem to to have been doing that very well. And and beyond your philanthropic endeavors, obviously, you're you're involved with product development and promotion as well. I understand. So tell us about the Repent Super Shot, and, and what makes it different from similar products out there on the market. Okay, so Repent with Repent, it's a hangover remedy, and it's basically a nano based remedy where all the nutrients that you lose um, from drinking, we basically shrank them to uh, one one thousandth size of the human hair. So which means when you drink Repent, it enters the bloodstream on a cellular level, which makes it more efficient and works quickly. So that's the difference where these other things are just where your body's only going to absorb about 20% of it. You've got to drink a lot of Gatorade, which has a lot of sugar and things like that. This does it and actually goes into your bloodstream and it should work, like I said, in about 15 to 20 minutes. And it's... um. It's just scientifically made where the nanos are just reduced and things like that. And I'm not like an ambassador for this. I'm actually an owner, so I own 50% of this. So this is just something that I'm not pushing for a check, but this is something I stand behind and I truly believe in. And I've tried it, so I know that it works. Shifting over to your football career now, Brian, you played mm-hmm. at the University of Miami for two seasons, like I said, and you, you transferred from a junior college. So do you think your time mm-hmm. at JUCO kind of made you even hungrier for collegiate football once you got to the NCAA? It, it did. Um, being in the junior college, uh, for one, was my time to learn to even play that position because in high school I played defensive end. So when I got to the junior college, I, I got discovered really late, so it was after the National Signing Day. So in my mind, I just figured, hey, it's an opportunity for me to just get a free education and I'll play football. That's what it's going to do. Um, so a guy, Frank Verducci from Iowa, he sent me there um, to Scranton, Pennsylvania on a full scholarship. And I was supposed to go to Iowa after I completed my two years. However, um, the head coach, Hayden Fry, retired after my first season at the junior college. Mm. And a whole new staff came and I was no longer ob- obligated to attend. Um, Iowa. So now it opened up the floodgates for me to entertain all, all these other different schools. And after my first year of junior college, I became an All-American there as well. So now it, it brought me like a lot of attention. So it's just funny how things work. And then Miami became one of the schools that came up to visit as well as like Arkansas and a few others. And then Miami is where I decided to go. But in junior college, why? I'm going to go back to the same when you said um, me not missing any games and stuff due to injuries because I had to play through a lot of injuries in junior college and we didn't have the fancy training rooms and trainers to help you. Like if I had sprained ankles, I had to call home and figure out things to do and they would wrap my ankles up. So um, my coach always told me you can't make the club in the tub, so you just had to pick it up because you didn't want to lose your position. So I would play through things and just figure out ways to um, to mentally, you know, put myself in position and still be, you know, effective. Obviously, like I said, you make the Pro Bowl, you win a Super Bowl, you achieve so much in the NFL. So among these, what would you say is kind of the most memorable or one of your favorite experiences? Um, definitely my favorite experience is the Super Bowl because that's the reason why a lot of these, you know, athletes go to play, they, to be able to mm-hmm. reach the highest point. I was able to win the national championship in college, so I was able to reach the highest point there and become All-Americans so did the highest point there. Became a Pro Bowl player, so I reached the highest point as a personal play, as personally, and making mm-hmm. a Pro Bowl, and then as a team, I'm making the Super Bowl. So I, at that point, I felt I accomplished everything that I set out to ever do in that sport. So it didn't make any sense for me to keep lingering around and still be able to lead gracefully, still playing at a high level, and not, like, hanging around to the point where people are like, okay, 
he like you're starting to see me decline. I want to still be the lead. <laughs> yeah. You know, after I accomplish everything, and still be playing at a high level. Yeah, I mean that. You, sometimes you just got to know when to call it quits, and I think it's it's better to, right. to go when you're at the highest level of your performance. That's definitely good that you decided to do that. And then you turned your attentions to the entertainment business. Like, I, I understand. So that's definitely exciting for you, I'm sure. What led you to join the cast of Love & Hip Hop, and what can viewers expect from your participation in that show coming up? You know, originally I was asked a few times, and I declined because I was just trying to figure out, I don't know if that fits what I'm trying to do, but then mm-hmm. at the same time, you know, talking to a couple of people, they were saying, you know, you're doing a lot of things in the community, you're doing a lot of events and stuff, you should probably use that as a platform. So once it was told to me from that standpoint, I decided, okay, I can go on here and basically I kind of dictate what they can use, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's not like they can make me do something, I can kind of control what I give them, they use. So uh-huh. um, when I signed on, they had already finished like the pilot part, so they kind of knew the direction they wanted to go um, first season and so I was just implemented because they just wanted me to be part of the show, but I'll probably play a bigger role um, in season two. Um, we just got to see how things pan out. Well, there you go, guys. Make sure to go check that out. Brian, thank you again so much for sharing. Where can listeners go to get more info and kind of keep up to date with you? They could definitely follow me on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, which is all the same. I'm actually on LinkedIn as well, and it's all Brian McKinney, B-R-Y-A-N-T-M-C-K-I-N-N-I-E. Well, there you go, everyone. Make sure to hit him up on social media. Bryant, thank you so much again. All right, everyone, the Sports Watch Dog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. We'll be right back after this short break. In the bright Arizona sun and even on cloudy days, protecting your eyes from dangerous UV rays is important. Now, finding fashionable and functional sunglasses is easier and more budget-friendly than ever thanks to sunglasswarehouse.com. They offer an array of stylish sunnies that won't break the bank. With hundreds of designs for every activity, you're certain to find a pair that fits your needs and lifestyle. Check them out at sunglasswarehouse.com. Hey there, everyone. You're listening to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. I'm your host, Mason Kern, and joining us now is Chris Holden, a former San Diego State basketball player and current assembly member for the 41st Assembly District in California. In the midst of March Madness, Chris announced introduction of his legislation, Assembly Bill 2747, the College Athletes Civil Rights Act of 2018, to protect college athletes from harmful policies by the NCAA. The legislation would allow college athletes to self-organize, create the possibility of the Olympic model for themselves, such as commercial sponsorship, and to help protect college athletes from abuses by college coaches, trainers, and other athletic staff. If adopted, the legislation would be the first law in the country to regulate the NCAA. This bill adopts language declaring that, and I quote, college athletes are employees with the right to self-organization and to be protected from retaliation while they are engaged in concerted activities for mutual aid and protection. This provision in the bill would allow players to come together to protect themselves in a variety of ways, including but not limited to unionization. The bill also includes provisions that could protect college athletes from some of the worst abuses seen on college campuses, such as sexual assault. So Chris has joined us today to provide some insight on his Assembly Bill 2747, the College Civil Rights Act of 2018. Hey, Chris, so glad to have you here. Thanks for joining the Sports Watch Talk Radio Show. Well, thank you, Mason, for, for having me on. Yeah, thank you again for coming on today. So first off, can you tell me a little more about your bill, including what college athletes stand to gain from it and what the impetus actually was for it? Was there any real situation or, or experience in particular? Well, I think part of what we've noticed over the years is that college athletes uh, obviously uh, have what we would basically determine as an employee relationship. They are, uh, and it's actually established, this bill is basically built on the foundation um, and language that comes from the National Labor Relations Board, uh, their general counsel memorandum. This is under the Obama administration where they declare college athletes are employees with mm-hmm. the right to self-organize and to be protected from retaliation. And so that became the foundation of what uh, 2747 is designed to do. And you know, we see that uh, given the, the, the billions of dollars that the NC2A generates uh, over the course of a year, uh, and also universities, <clears throat> that athletes put themselves on the line day in and day out uh, at practice and in a game. Uh, they are impacted surely from their educational opportunities. And so when we looked at this and start to see that uh, injuries can cause uh, these athletes to have their college careers cut short, uh, the 
ability for those who are performing at a high level in Division I, most notably, uh, where their images, uh, their, um, their names are used for financial gain mm -hmm. for everyone but for them. Uh, this is the, an issue we thought that needed to be taken on. And if they are employees and they, under the Labor Relations uh, Board's uh, uh, determination, uh, then they need to have the ability to protect themselves, to, um, to form an association, much like uh, students can do today on campuses, but athletes are not, to be able to speak out without having to feel that they will have retaliation uh, against them and their ability to do so. And for a lot of these kids, they can't gamble. They, they just can't put themselves in a position where they can step out uh, like this and to be able to, uh, to, to speak for what they believe are their rights that are not being uh, established and they're not getting the protections that they feel that they need uh, because this is all they have. And to be put in that kind of jeopardy, uh, they need to have better safeguards. And so we think that this is a, a timely bill to try to address uh, a lot of these issues that have been talked about and debated for, for many years. Mm, timely indeed. I would definitely agree. And I think it, it kind of comes down to that central point, are these athletes employees? And, and I think there's definitely the argument there that they are. And and obviously with all the scandals going on in, in the past NCAA basketball season with Sean Miller and DeAndre Ayton at U of A, and then as well as some of the other mid-major school scandals as well, w what is the bill you're proposing going to do to kind of offset this corruption that, that's kind of kind of happened throughout the NCAA? Well, we think that if there's sort of a, we understand that there has to be rules and regulations. We get that. But there, you know, for these young people who are in many cases putting in 40 hours a week uh, for their sport, uh, whether it's practice, games, traveling, and the like, uh, they deserve to have uh, the same basic rights as other students. If you take someone to dinner, uh, you have to jump through hoops to try to report a dinner. Uh, given these athletes the opportunity to understand what the procedures are so that they have an understanding of the rules and how to apply them, uh, to have certain things like uh, dinners and travel uh, addressed so that they aren't penalized, that they have to, their scholarship is put in jeopardy, their ability to play is put in jeopardy. I think those type of things can, this bill is designed to, uh, to relax and clarify and, and to allow for there not to be the same level of um, retribution against these athletes. Uh, clearly, uh, when you look at how the arenas and, and stadiums are being filled, uh, you know, on the, on the names of these players and uh, many of them, and I know we've had uh, conversations with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar around this bill, and he supports it and will be testifying mm -hmm. uh, for it. And, you know, they just recognize that to have a system that's set up in such a way for there to be such great profit on the part of the institutions and nothing for the kids who are out there putting it on the line day in and day out that that's what we're trying to get at. That's what we're trying to at least create a little bit better parity. Uh, we're looking at an Olympic model, uh, how the Olympians are at least have an opportunity to retain their, uh, their amateur status and yet be able to have uh, sponsorships. Uh, we're looking at uh, the potential of establishing a trust fund. So at the end of uh, the student athlete's uh, career, their playing time or the eligibility or upon graduation, that the money would accumulate in this trust fund where they would have that at their disposal at that time to extend their college uh, career or to have it uh, to go out and um, have been able to, to benefit something from mm -hmm. that experience, uh, much like everyone else uh, has been able to do. Well, Chris, thank you. That was all such great insight, and we'll look forward to seeing how this bill unfolds. Where can our listeners go to get more info on it? Well, um, you know, they can, uh, we have a website. Uh, they can easily Google my name, Chris Holden, California State Legislature, uh, and my website will pop up. We have telephone numbers for our Sacramento office. Uh, I can give you that number. It's 916-319-2048. Uh, 
1041. And they can reach our offices and get additional information or just uh, email us uh, through the website. Well, there you go, guys. Everyone, make sure you go check that out, and we'll see how this bill turns out. Thank you again, Chris. All right, everyone, the Sports Watch Shot Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. He'll be right back after this short break. Whether you're eating healthy in the new year, celebrating birthdays, or gifting just because, Grubhub e-gift cards complement any occasion. They're customizable, paired with personalized messages, then sent by email or printout, and redeemable right away to easily find and order food from over 1,100 U.S. cities. Grubhub e-gift cards never expire and can be used for delicious orders through the Grubhub.com website or mobile apps. Search by cuisine, restaurant name, or menu item. You ready to hoop it up? This is Happenings on the Hardwood. Now, as always, at the end of the Sports Watch Shop radio show here on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060, we're going to pivot over and focus on some basketball. So, we go to the NBA this week. March Madness is now over, first of all. Villanova did win the championship game. Kind of a blowout fashion over Michigan. Villanova just looked dominant all year, honestly. Michigan really didn't stand a chance against Jalen Brunson and his squad, but DiVincenzo from Villanova, I mean, he went off. That kid really increased his draft stock after that performance, 30-plus points, I believe, and, God, DiVincenzo just went off on a faulty Michigan defense. They couldn't do enough to stop him. Mo Wagner played well throughout the entire tournament, and he'll probably get a bounce or a boost, I should say, in his draft stock as well. But now we're done with March Madness. We go over to the NBA, and... It's a playoff race at this point, guys. It's The playoffs are approaching. The Eastern Conference is tight from like 6 to 11. What's even tighter is the Western Conference. It's very surprising because from five, from the San Antonio Spurs, who are in the fifth slot right now, on through eight, really through about 12, they're, all the records are almost the same. Each team is only a game or half a game behind in those slots. And it's going to be really interesting to see how the playoffs come about because of... The, the tightness in the Western Conference, and because this, these teams, as it goes Spurs, you have the Lakers, who, who aren't in it this year, Phoenix Suns, who are definitely not in it this year, those teams are rebuilding, but then you have teams, like, like I said, the Spurs, and you also have Denver Nuggets, Portland Trailblazers, Oklahoma City Thunder, all these teams trying to fight for a spot in the Western Conference playoffs. At the end of the day, I don't think it's really going to matter all that much because Western Conference Finals is probably going to be a matchup between the Golden State Warriors and the Houston Rockets. I think it's the Houston Rockets' year this year, honestly. Uh, they, they're 65-14 and 14 right now, and the Golden State Warriors already have 23 or 22 losses or something like that. And so when you look at it on paper, I think James Harden, Chris Paul, Clint Capella, those guys are really building something promising in Houston. And I think it might be time that Golden State's dynasty comes to an end. But... Speaking of the Phoenix Suns, like I mentioned earlier, no chance at the playoffs. The worst record in the NBA, only have 20 wins. They got their last win against the, the Sacramento Kings. I was at that game. It was their first win in the 15 loss streak. So that was a franchise leading loss streak. They finally ended it. Only won by three. They were up by like seven with only uh, 12 seconds remaining. And they gave up two straight threes. Only down by three, and then Sacramento just happens to miss two wide-open looks. So Phoenix really got lucky. But I caught up with multiple players. Daniel House Jr. had an amazing game, very productive performance. I can see him making a huge impact on an NBA team if he does decide to leave Phoenix. Here's what he had to say after his performance. I gotta give credit to my teammates. Uh, they they was able to make shots and I was able to get open. Hey Jared, uh, <laughs> I was able to get open and knock down some shots. And uh, of course, uh, we communicated on defense as a team, and then uh, we just took turns rebounding the ball. Alex Lynn was also coming back after a three-game absence in which he was suffering from left ankle soreness, and I think it was a sprain actually. And he put up 15 rebounds, 17 points, double double. Leads the team double doubles this season with 11. And here's what he had to say following his productive night. Um, I mean, uh, this late in the season, uh, everybody in the great shape. Even though I've been out for four games, but I came back. My other, otherwise, besides my ankle, my body felt great, so I didn't get winning. I just I felt great. So like I said, this Phoenix Suns team only has 20 wins right now. We'll see who they decide to take, probably top three in the upcoming NBA draft. DeAndre Ayton has said he might want to be a little Shaq and Kobe action. 
But we'll have to wait and see who the Phoenix Suns decide to take. Like I said, probably in that top three pick in the upcoming NBA draft. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Anybody wanting to connect with me, the Sports Watchdog, on Twitter can do so at a Sports Watchdog, and on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as well at the Sports Watchdog. So until next time, keep your eye on the ball. The Sports Watchdog. The Sports Watchdog, Ace and Kern.